Hello and welcome to uh, our next lecture in childhood psychopathology. We're going to finish up discussions of intellectual development disorders. Um, today we'll be talking about specific development disorders, um, talk about some treatment strategies, and then we'll talk uh, at the end about uh, learning disorders and learning disabilities. So intellectual development disorder involves two types of deficits that are evident before the age of 18. These are deficits in intellectual functioning, so sort of general intellectual functioning, problem solving, math, reading, etc. But also deficits in adaptive behavior. Um, so these are sort of uh, mastering age appropriate tasks of daily living, being able to feed yourself, walk, cook, bathe, all of those kinds of daily living tasks that um, we learn as we start to grow up, or at least some of us do. Um, so uh, those kind of adaptive behaviors are separate from intellectual functioning because oftentimes uh, while an individual might have deficits in intellectual functioning, they're still able to um, learn adaptive behaviors uh, and are able to care for themselves. So some specific developmental disorders we will talk about. Uh, the first is uh, the most common, which is called Down syndrome. Uh, it's caused by an extra chromosome uh, 21. It's called trisomy 21, uh, technically. Uh, this is a purely genetic disorder. There is a lot of controversy about um, prenatal genetic testing for this disorder. Uh, I'm not going to wade into that. Um, just note that it is a controversy uh, and a very difficult decision uh, for people to often make. So Down syndrome is the most, among the most widely known genetically influenced forms of in, uh, intellectual development disorder. It has accompanying physical characteristics as well as intellectual challenges. There's sort of a um, facial feature uh, commonality across Down syndrome kids. Um, these kids are often uh, very uh, happy, delightful um, to be around, just a little bit of a challenge in terms of their intellectual abilities. Uh, children with Down syndrome, again, are reported mostly as happy and outgoing. Um, I have uh, family members who've worked uh, a great deal with these individuals, um, and uh, they can be, as I said, quite delightful um, uh, to work with. Uh, generally happy, generally outgoing, generally able to uh, engage in occupations, uh, as well as being able to uh, support themselves and take care of themselves. Uh, Williams syndrome it used to be tied in more directly with uh, autism spectrum disorders. It is, however, a separate disorder uh, or syndrome. It's caused by a micro deletion on chromosome 7. Uh, this particular syndrome is characterized by deficits in general cognitive functioning, uh, visual spatial kill skills as well, uh, so sort of general cognitive functions, uh, but uh, interestingly, relative strengths in both language and music domains. And in fact, oftentimes, uh, William syndrome kids are what we might call a musical savant, uh, very gifted in musical ability. Uh, children with William syndrome are generally socially outgoing, but they can display some uninhibited tendencies um, and have uh, quite a bit of fear and social anxiety. And so charting a course with these kids oftentimes just requires uh, some good cognitive behavioral therapy, some good social development, group therapy, um, socialization, uh, that sort of thing. Finally, we get to Fragile X syndrome. Uh, fragile X syndrome is caused by mutation in the FIDD1 gene. This is far more common in males. In fact, it's the most common type of inherited intellectual developmental disorder in boys, affecting about 1 in 4,000, um, which is about twice the rate at which it's found in girls, which is about 1 in 8,000. Uh, speech and communication difficulties underlie the fragile X cognitive profile. Um, so oftentimes this is uh, particularly difficult for males who already oftentimes uh, have uh, lower verbal and uh, communication abilities uh, already. Uh, so uh, lots of difficulty with uh, Fragile X Syndrome. Again, this is kind of just a quick highlight of some of the issues involved in intellectual development disorders. Some treatment strategies, uh, mostly it's uh, family support. Uh, there are financial and social difficulties of raising a child with intellectual disabilities. Um, so uh, generally setting up school support, social support, making sure the parents um, are not overwhelmed uh, because, you know, rather than the normal developmental timeline where kids become more independent, uh, that oftentimes either never, ha never happens or takes a great deal longer. Uh, some intervention strategies, generally trying to maximize the potential of the individual. So these are very individualized plans uh, to try to meet the developmental demands. 
while also doing things like modifying the environment to better match the individual's deficits and strengths. And so here we're going to bring an occupational therapist, a physical therapist perhaps, um, and have them work uh, with the family and the home and help modify the home, use some assistive technology. Um, there are lots of great um, tools available uh, in addition to psychotherapy and um, helping out the parents with their coping strategies, but to actually help modify the environment uh, to uh, meet those kind of demands. Uh, so therapies will include sort of behavioral and um, cognitive treatments and socio-emotional programs. And again, family educational and vocational planning. Um, there are lots of vocational opportunities for um, individuals with uh, intellectual development disorder in which they can actually get out and uh, work in the community, um, live in group homes together. There are lots of really good opportunities uh, for this community uh, to take advantage of. But again, occupational therapists, um, recreational therapists, vocational therapists, music therapists, uh, etc., are all uh, part of the treatment team. Uh, some pharmacological treatments tend to be associated with violent outbursts or maladaptive behaviors in some of these uh, populations. So these are generally um, anti-epileptic medications or antipsychotic medications. Um, and so uh, there is some controversy about that, um, but they are part of the treatment plan uh, on occasion uh, for these individuals. That gets us to learning disorders. And uh, this field uh, really needs uh, to grow quite a bit. Uh, the new laws we discussed in previous lectures have kind of muddied the waters a little bit. Um, but to be diagnosed under the DSM with a specific learning disorder, uh, an individual has to meet four criteria. First, they have to have difficulties in at least one of the following areas for at least six months despite targeted help. This would be reading, understanding what is being read or reading comprehension, we would call that, spelling, written expression, number concepts, number facts or calculation, or mathematical reasoning. Now, one of the things I want to make very clear is an individual cannot be very good at one of these and not necessarily have a learning disorder. I can't spell to save my life. Never have been able to. Um, but I've never considered it a learning disorder. It's just, who knows? I mean, maybe it was a learning disorder, um, but um, not an important one as far as I'm concerned. Um, these individuals will have academic skills that are substantially below what is expected for a, child age, a child's age and cause problems in school work or everyday activities. Here's the reason why I wouldn't have a learning disorder, because while I can't spell, my academic skills were always um, on par in general. Um, <laughs> difficulties will generally start during the school age. Uh, it's possible to be diagnosed with a learning disorder as an adult uh, when those significant problems might crop up might be associated with something new, uh, associated with a new job, graduate school, something hard to say. Um, so it doesn't have to be diagnosed as a child, but the difficulties will have started during the school age. And these learning difficulties are not due to other conditions. And so these are independent of other potential um, problems. So general categories of learning disorders, um, these include, um, these are specific learning disorders. We'll talk about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and some other issues that disrupt learning, um, but these are specific to uh, types of learning disorders. So dyslexia is a term that refers to difficulty with reading. And the sort of stereotype is individuals see letters backwards. It's really not that. It's a letter recognition, word recognition problem um, associated with using context to drive perception, um, et cetera. Uh, people with dyslexia have difficulty connecting letters they see on a page with the sounds they make. So there's a disconnection um, between uh, one type of sensory processing and another. So reading becomes a slow, effortful, and not fluent process for them. It becomes much more difficult. Uh, people with dyslexia often try to avoid activities associated with reading. So they won't read um, for pleasure, they won't read instructions, um, that sort of thing, because it's uh, very difficult because of that uh, sensory disconnection. Dysgraphia is a term to, used to describe uh, difficulties with putting one's thoughts onto paper. Uh, so writing problems, these can include difficulties with spelling, grammar, punctuation, and handwriting. Um, so. Um, in my cognitive neuroscience class, we talk about agraphia, which is an inability to write uh, at all, handwriting. Um, what's interesting is individuals who can be agraphic but not alexic, that is, they can read, but they can't, uh, that is, or they can be alexic, 
and, or a graphic or one or the other. So they can write something, uh, but they can't read what they've just written, uh, or they can read, but they can't write. Um, so uh, alexia or dysgraphia and dyslexia are both language disorders, but at different parts of the um, problem. Dyscalculia is a term to describe uh, number-related concepts or symbol-based processing. Um, so um, algebra, for example, is a symbol-based um, system. So using symbols and functions to perform math calculations, including number sense, memorizing math facts, math cal calculation, math reasoning, and math problem solving. Now, dyscalculia is different from people just not liking math um, or you know, just simply trying to avoid math. Uh, these are two different types of learning difficulties. And so one of the things we always have to be cautious of is not ascribing uh, a disorder with um, something else. Now here's where we get into the problem. Uh, sorry, one more slide before we get there. Uh, there are variations in the severity of learning disorders. These can be mild. Some difficulties with learning in one or two academic areas, but able to compensate. Moderate, these would be significant difficulties with learning, requiring some specialized teaching and some accommodations or supportive services. Uh, finally, to severe, these will be severe difficulties with learning affecting several academic areas and requiring ongoing intensive specialized teaching, assistive technology, etc. So finally, we get to treating learning disorders. Uh, special education and remediation efforts are usually based on an individualized education plan or an IEP. And these are designed specifically for students with learning disorders. Uh, the problem that uh, I'm finding is, is there is really not a great deal of uh, evidence-based practices in terms of what are the best ways to approach these learning disorders, which is surprising given uh, the prolifer proliferation of um, supposed ways in which to help individuals with these learning disorders. And so one of the things we need is uh, systematic research processes in which we can actually investigate uh, these p specific types of learning disorders and the best ways in which to assist uh, those individuals suffering from them. All right, so that is our quick introduction to intellectual development disorders. Uh, next lecture, we will be getting into um, autism.